Whole Foods Zero Calorie Cola is the cola that will cause your children to have leukemia <laughs> and taste like it too. This is horrific. <laughs> and I am a big fan of all the zero sodas. I drink a uh, two liter of Dr. Pepper Cherry Zero every day. And this is just really, really, really. And Whole Foods started here in Austin. Did it? Yeah, the first Whole Foods is here. Keep Austin weird, by which they mean stuff white people like. Yeah. <laughs> we, um, I, I wanted one yesterday and he came in with it and I didn't properly look at it. I just saw like in the distance, a bit of black, a bit of red. I was like, all right, it's got the Coke Zero. And then Jeremy went and poured it with a glass of ice. And so I was tasting, I was like, this this doesn't seem nice. But I thought it was the ice. Yeah, I thought yeah. the ice had fucked it. And then I went and got another can. I was like, no, this And is that's the other thing. Sometimes it's fun. Like when you go to H-E-B and instead of Dr. Pepper, they have like Mr. Lightning. And you're like, all right, let me, <laughs> let me try this. But this is, this is a problem. Whole Foods is expensive. Yeah. Holy shit. We went this morning. What was it like? Like eight? $90 or something. We just got stuff for breakfast. Yeah. We got like, we got like a little plastic plate of um, ham that was $19. It was like $10 for 12 eggs. It was... Way, way more than we're paying in the UK. Were they chicken eggs? I, I hope so. Were they, they? They got all kinds of weird eggs over there. What do you mean? They sell like like emu eggs and ostrich eggs and quail eggs and probably lizard. Who knows? I'm pretty sure ours are chicken eggs. All right. <laughs> Fucking hope so. No, I've got to have a coffee. I don't even like black coffee. Daddy makes me drink it. Oh, okay. How <laughs> have you been, Michael? I've been phenomenal. The third time got to talk to you, which uh, which is great. Uh, and I always kind of confess to you, I'm not an anarchist. I'm a Bitcoiner. Um, but uh, it's very hard. But a lot of the Bitcoiners are anarchists, as you know. They are. Uh, some are libertarians. I always struggle to fully uh, separate their opinions and what they stand for. Um, but the more I do this show, the more the world goes completely fucking mad. It gets really hard to keep justifying this broken democratic system we yes. have in the UK. Oh, it's even worse there than here. Yeah, because we don't have optionality. Correct. And I think the British culture is a lot worse than the American culture in many ways. Well, in that we're just subservient and accept it. Yeah, and I think there's this sense that, um, which is not incorrect, that Britain's best days are behind her, whereas I don't think Americans have this view, even if it were true. Uh, I don't think we believe that, but I think people externally could see that. So I, I, I do. I mean, we're just a tiny little yeah. island now. Uh, we're lucky to have a seat at the Security Council table. Right. Um, and we backed way out of our league. But I don't think we stam for anything anymore that anyone really gives a shit about. Yeah, if you think about how much uh, of our intellectual history is due to the components of the United Kingdom worldwide, it's just extraordinary. It's just crazy. It, it's just talk about punching above your weight, not just in terms of, I don't even mean imperialism, just to mean the, the minds that came out of what was later the UK is just extraordinary. And now it, it's, it's not that way at all. I don't think Britain is disproportionately this kind of intellectual seat of power. Although there was certain, a lot, certainly a lot of heavyweights coming out of you know, Great Britain. We also have a, the way our politics is set up is slightly different in that um, you had two very divided lines and uh, where in the UK, whilst we have divided lines, they really have come to the center Yes, and they're way more politically correct. Yes, And so no, no politician really stands for anything meaningful. Uh, no one is really willing to challenge uh, anything that seems kind of nonsense. So we just kind of have these two sides battling over very minor things. It's like, who's going to spend the money the best, best at the next election right. rather than the, the meaningful things. If, I mean, I know enough about British politics that it's unimaginable that anyone would even say the words, and please correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. uh, NHS reform. To have any kind of meaningful change to the NHS other than increasing it, you know, dramatically, I think that, it, wouldn't they be dead on arrival? Yeah, it, it's a real problem now. Um, we've talked about that a lot on this show uh, because, I mean, the NHS is fucked. It's completely fucked. We've got massive issues with wait times, massive issues with ambulances, massive issue with funding, waiting. It's just, the whole thing is an absolute mess. It's very clear it's not working. But I don't think you have to have massive reforms. You could have incremental forms and just very minor ones. I've stopped going to the NHS doctor. I go to a private doctor now. It's £50 for an appointment. I get seen. Usually, if I turn up on the same day because they know me, they'll find a gap. And if I phone up, it's usually the same day or the next day. And you're seeing a doctor who knows you because it's small practice. Mm -hmm. He knows everything about you. It's a personal relationship. Whereas if I try and get into local NHS, sometimes it's three weeks. 
Wow. Yeah, unless you've got like some massive emergency and they'll try and get someone to call you. And it's a, you know, but these place, places will see you for £50. I, I talked to my dad about this. He's in Ireland. It's £50 for everyone within their health system. And just like a minor difference like that would stop. That would remove a huge amount of waste. But they won't even do that. I'll put this in perspective for you. We had a guy on the show recently. The receipts for the government at the moment, tax receipts, was it 1.1 trillion? Yes, I think so. Yeah, 1.1 trillion. Would you have a, a guess of how much of that goes to the NHS? Oh, I have no clue. I... 200 billion. Wow, okay. Yeah, so about 20% for a shit service. Which everyone loves, though, in principle. They the love the idea of the NHS. They love the idea. It, I think that even that is starting to fracture. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I think, I think that's starting to fracture, but no political party is going to turn around and say, yeah, here we go. This is the public spending in the UK. Wow. So it's it's 50% more than on Social Security. It's almost double. Oh, it is double. Education. Twice as much on healthcare as on education. Yeah. Uh, where's, um, yeah. So th this is the, one, the one thing I found most interesting, though. Dead interest. Yeah. Dead interest is higher than education. Oh, wow. That's bad. Yes. That's very bad. So they're spending more on their own stupid borrowing and yes. spending than they are on education. Wow. Yeah. And double, well, I guess Britain doesn't really need that much money for defense, particularly. Well, we've got you guys. We just do yeah, as exactly. we're told and you yeah. protect us. Um, but yeah, so the, the problem with the NHS, it's a bit like here. Can you imagine Biden saying, no infrastructure bill, we're going to raise taxes, we're going to cut spending. It's yeah, you, yeah I, I'm going to disagree with you because really? if you look at uh, Canada, Trudeau's dad, um, Pierre Trudeau, when you have the leftist party, they're the ones who are in a position to have these austerity measures and get away with it because there's no one really to their left to criticize them. Okay. In the same way that when Reagan jacked up spending in the 80s, you couldn't really criticize him because who's good, he's the, on the right wing of the right wing party. So you, in many of these countries, um, in, in Europe as well, you have these parliaments, it's the lefties who have the political space to do something about it. That said, I do not think there's any possibility of Joe Biden saying what you had just said. Yeah, well, we had the only austerity we've had recently was under a conservative government, right. and they were seen as evil, greedy, and rich. it was barely anything. Yeah, I mean, there were some really weird policies they did. They did this bedroom tax, whereby if you had a council property and you had two bedrooms, they they did these weird taxes that you couldn't get away from. Um, but um, but the, the reason I was bringing this up, more of a setup for what we're going to talk about today, is we did this interview, and this guy said. Uh, the problem with governments now is their insurance companies. Okay. He was explaining that um, to fund the war, say World War II, they would get into massive debt. But after the war, they would be able to pay off the debt by ra raising taxes, knowing productivity would increase, and also the spending on military would have to stop. But because there's been no war, governments have gradually spent more and more money. And now if, if you bring that back up, Danny, yeah. if you look, I mean, the NHS is essentially a health insurance. We all yes. contribute into that, into the health insurance. Um, <laughs> he's a good follower on uh, Twitter, actually. Uh, public pensions are essentially a, an old age insurance. Yeah. Um, social security is an insurance. Def I, I would say education is slightly different. That's more of a public service. Defense is an insurance. State protection is an insurance. Transport, I mean, phew, more infrastructure. But he said the majority of government spending is kind of insurances for what people can't do themselves. And he, he was explaining that this you, you just trend to a more and more unproductive society. Therefore, your debt increases, and you, this is how you unwind the currency. And, and I think this is what is drawing me more into at least the libertarian world of smaller government and more responsible spending, which is why it's good to come and talk to you again. Yeah, uh, it's, to me, the horrors of uh, socialized medicine aren't you know three-week wait times, which... If that's the worst you could say about a system, it's not the end of the world. But it's things like when you have politicians prioritizing whose lives matter over other people's lives. And this happened to my friend, Lauren Chen, during the COVID situation. Um, she's a popular podcaster, you might know her. And her dad had been diagnosed with cancer. I don't have the exact details, but he either couldn't get treatment or a checkup because all the priority was for COVID. And you, it's not like you could just pay, you know, they have a monopoly there, so you couldn't really pay someone else or some, your own private oncologist. And she's sitting there and she said to herself, why am I funding my own oppression? And just the, the powerlessness to feel that, you know, I know my father has cancer and I know every day that passes, it's not like 
you know, I have cancer Tuesday on, a, on Wednesday, it's going to go in a good direction. Yeah. It only goes in a worse direction. You just don't know how fast and, 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 and how much time you have left. So those kind of horror stories. And speaking of what you said earlier, you know, if, if those um, regular visits get outside the realm of the average person and you b- encourage people uh, or you incentivize them in whatever way to have this kind of emergency room medical care, which we have here. You can't legally turn someone away from an emergency room, I think is how the law is written. Point being, if I have a broken leg or swallowed some poison and you just got shot, you know, you're all being treated kind of the same. And it's really not every emergency is an emergency in the same sense. Like if I have the flu, it's an emergency in that I can't go on like this for another two weeks, but there's no possibility really I'm dying the next day, right? Mm. I just feel like complete crap. But if you're bleeding out, you know, that is a, we have to take care of this right now. Uh, Obviously they have different ways of sorting this thing out, but what ends up happening is you're going to the emergency room and you think I'm gonna see someone quickly. You're sitting there for hours. And you know, if you have something to the point where you're going to the emergency room, maybe it's not I'm shot and I'm bleeding out, but it certainly takes a lot, I think, for most people to be like, all right, I need to go not to a doctor, to the hospital right now. Yeah. I actually had to go to the hospital when I was in, uh, where were we, Miami? Miami. I have a weird heart thing where I get these things called SVTs. It feels like a heart attack, but it's completely harmless. Um, it's just electrical signals. But when it happens, you have to go to the hospital just in case you're having a heart attack. That happened to my friend now. Yeah. And this is the great thing about aging. They told her these are the beginning stages of menopause. And she's had to go to the hospital twice because she thought, like, like, she's like, they're like, no, 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 you're just getting old. So she's a month older than me. And it's really, I'm so glad I'm a dude that I don't have to have mother nature tell me it's a wrap. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I, well, I'm not in my menopause. So it's not a stage for me. <laughs> you don't know that. No, I don't, well, they, actually, I mean, these started with me for a, a decade ago when I used to take drugs. It was okay. drug induced and, and I haven't done uh, drugs in years, but but they still come occasionally, yeah. very occasionally. And I have to go to the hospital just in case because it is a heart attack. I have to be treated. So anyway, we went to the local oh hospital God. in Miami. Uh, it's happened like six times in a decade. But it's so terrifying because there's a non, because I, I well, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, yeah. I, I was choking on a piece of food once. And I remember my brain thinking, there's a non-zero chance you're going to die. Like yeah. you have to take care of this. You're almost certainly going to be fine, but there is a non-zero chance this is a wrap. So for you, it's the same thing. I'm like, I know this is the, the situation, but I'm not 100% sure. Well, yeah. well the first one, I thought oh, yeah. I was. Yeah. So the first one was horrendous. Basically, I, I had this kind of like feeling in my center of my stomach. It was like, like a heat. And I was like, this feels really weird. And my hands went clammy and I looked it up and it was like, oh, symptoms of a heart. Then everything came in. Then my heart started racing. I went up to 200 beats per minute. Um, I started to feel faint. Every single symptom, the ambulance came. Wait, isn't that the best way to get a heart attack? You go online, you read WebMD, and you're like, all right, this is, now you're going to give yourself one. Well, yeah, so I did, I obviously escalated <laughs> from that. So anyway, they calmed me down in the hospital. And yeah, that was a, that was a trigger to, to never do drugs again. Uh, and, and each time, you're right, every time, I mean, I was slightly panicked in Miami, wasn't yeah, I? My of lips, course you should be. My lips went well, all cold. You're, you're also having this kind of, your brain is throwing the adrenaline, right? So it's telling you fight or flight. So you're going to have the panic just on a physiological level. And you yeah. went so pale. Really pale. My lips, I, I felt like they'd gone blue. So anyway, we went to the emergency room and the experience, there were two things that were uh, the same, two things that are very different. The things that were the same was same length of weight. Oh, okay. Exactly the same length of weight, four, four-ish hours to be seen. Uh, which obviously if I was having a heart attack, I would have been dead. So that that was that. And in terms of the staff, I still th- I thought the staff were brilliant. You can tell in both places that they really care. The, the, main, the main difference for me actually, one, obviously you have to pay in America, but the second one was the amount of things they checked. So in the UK, they do a quick blood test, they uh, check your pulse, mm-hmm. and that was it. I had about eight different tests and they gave me aspirin and everything. So they do a lot more. And I asked what the difference was. And then they said, well, in the US, they're worried about being sued. Okay. So the, tr- the treatment was different, but that was based on the incentive incentives, model, yes. incentives of the system. But the actual, the majority of the treatment was exactly the same. And Michael, I, the, my problem is I, I don't know what the right answer is with this because I know, say, in the UK with a socialized healthcare system, our cancer care is quite poor compared to the US. If you've got a kid who's got quite serious cancer, they often raise money to come here to get treated. 
But if you have a full free market for healthcare, God knows what they're going to be trying to convince us we need, what pill we need to be taking. We know that you doctors... You mean like now? Well, exactly like now, but how much worse could it be? I think, I, I think it would be a lot better because I think people are much more suspicious of corporate propaganda than they are of government propaganda. Like if I have, if you have Pepsi telling you drink Pepsi, it'll make sure you don't have heart palpitations, you would laugh about it, right? But yeah. if you have Fauci telling you, your neighbor will tell you, you need to be drinking your Pepsi. Huh. Don't you think? I think there's a slight difference between the UK and the US for this. Okay. Yeah, I do. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I, we have less of a problem with like prescription drugs anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you're all alcoholics. Oh, that's true. Hey, like the, the amount of self-medicating in Britain about with alcohol is, is and you, the thing, I, I've only been vis- to um, uh, London once. I did not enjoy it. But you guys start at like five o'clock. That's what's, cr- like the work's done. It's like, all right, let's get plastered. It's just, it's so bizarre to me as an American. Well, it's even more than that. If you go to an airport, it's all, all rules are off. It doesn't matter what time you get there. Is that right? Yeah, it's just airport rules. Here okay. In international. It's territory. five o'clock somewhere. It's five o'clock somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we do have a, a big. I've been twelve days without drinking, by the way. Good for you. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm thinking I might do the whole year. Maybe you're not gonna do the whole year. No, I might do. No, you're not gonna last. Oh no. I mean, I'm with you. I don't think he's gonna. If last. it's twelve days and you're proud of twelve days, you're not doing three sixty five. It's not happening. The only way it will happen is if we say it won't. No, the only way it'll happen is if he starts taking some other drug. Uh, if he pivots to some other drug of choice, like, like black coffee. coffee, black, black coffee. coffee. Yeah. Yeah, I think I can do. I'm gonna. All right, give me a year, Michael Manners. Would you like to make a bet right now? Yeah, what's the bet? Okay, what's the bet going to be? If I do it, I come on your show. Well, you come on my show anyway. All right. uh, One Bitcoin. That's a big bet. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That would be interesting. That's a big bet. Would you take it if it was that? I'd do the bet. One bit, but how how will I know he's telling the truth? Well, Danny will be honest. Um, Just promise Danny 10%. Uh, I think the problem with that is Bitcoin could be 100 grand in a year. I mean, how do you feel about that? Well, Bitcoin's a Bitcoin. The Bitcoin's a standard value, not yeah. the dollar amount. So that's, that's I, I, I'm a long-term Bitcoin person. Oh, so you, you've got a stack, right? Yeah, okay. I don't have a stack, but it, it's, certain, it's I, I, I'm not, I'd rather have my funds in Bitcoin than in fiat currency. I mean, I would, I would make that bet if you want to make that bet. I don't know that I know you well enough is the problem. So I don't know what my odds are here. All right, I tell you what, let's make it easier. Uh, uh, next, first time we're in Austin in the year, take me, for the best steak. Oh, yeah. that's a great that's a great bet. I will take you to an amazing dinner. Yeah, right. perfect. Because no one's going to tr- lie over a, a dinner. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, we got that. Fuck yeah, whole year. And, and we, we could find a cool restaurant to film at Michael, and make it an episode. There was no chance he was ever going to go for a year. Oh, I know, <laughs> but still, it's just. Uh, I uh, I bet by. Do, do you know I own a football team? Oh, soccer team. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, so my my vape and my manager vapes, and we both said we're going to give a new year, and we made a bet, and we agreed it would be from midnight, and I broke it two minutes past midnight. It's like Kramer on that Seinfeld episode where they agree not to jerk off, and then like five minutes later, he just slams the money on the table. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. He turned up for the game, and I was like, he. I, we had a game. We had a game three days later, and I and uh, I didn't tell him because I didn't want him to stop. But when he turned up, I was straight away. Here's fifty quid. Okay. Yeah. Lost that bet. But anyway, sorry. The, Wait, uh, I want to, let's put this on our calendar. All right. I'm going to put on my calendar right now to check a year from now. Well, first of January. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll do a calendar invite and invite you both. Yeah, yeah do that. You, you do that. So someone's picking up a nice tab. Do, do a, do a six-month check-in. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. It's my birthday in six months. The problem is if I've kept to it, I might not want to drink at the dinner. Whereas... Well, that's fine. If I lose, we will drink a fuckload. Well, I don't drink. Oh, you don't drink? No, it makes me meaner. How long have you not drunk? Uh, I don't remember the last time I've had a drink. Oh, so years. Yeah. I oh. mean, I'm not a I'm not an AAA. Like I've had a sip, like if someone has a cool cocktail, I'm like, let me try it. You know, but yeah, I've yeah. Never, I haven't had a drink. I don't know how long. Well, I'm saying 2023 because I kind of think I just want to stop. Well, you should. It's really, I, for that to be, I had a poll recently on Twitter and I said, you know, which of these like four drugs do you think has done the most damage? And it was like um, cocaine, marijuana, alcohol, or cigarettes. And alcohol, one carried it just ran with the numbers. God, what order? I'd go. I'd go. Alcohol, cigarettes, cocaine, marijuana. Yeah, same here. Yeah, because the number of people using cocaine is quite small. Yeah, I mean, if I, I've had sessions where I've done them all. And, but the other problem is alcohol has upsides. Tobacco's all downside, basically. 
Like yeah. alcohol, you know, you have a drink with dinner, wine culture, there's something to be said for that. So there's benefits to like cigarettes are like, I had a friend who worked for something called the American Council on Science and Health and they would be debunking health fears, you know, that, that's in the media. Like, oh, if you eat too many eggs, you're going to get fat. And they're like, no, 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 like tobacco, cigarettes, that's the one where it's as bad as people think. It's as addictive. It, I mean, it just destroys people's lives. And, you know, you see all these stories, people get older and they're like, what was I thinking? Yeah. You're like, what do I have to show for this? Like disgusting yellow teeth, I, everything I've smelled. Whenever I eat, I can't, I'm fixated on, let me finish this meal so I can smoke. It's just an awful, awful habit. So my dad smokes, he smokes his whole life, but he's never really drunk. Okay. But yeah, he has the occasional drink, might have one or two here. He, after my mum died, he didn't drink for nearly four years. And he, he's 74, he came over recently. I mean, he looks great. Aren't you concerned about his health? Um, I mean- His he, lungs? He's not going to stop now at 74 years old. This is something for my whole life. We try to get him to stop. He will not stop smoking. Okay, but it, you didn't answer my question. Am I concerned about his health? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. But does he have like a smoker's cough? Mm, sometimes. Okay. When it comes, it's like when he gets ill, it's really bad, and then it goes. Okay. But he, it's like his vice. Sure. He's like that's the one. We've tried. He he won't stop. I tried to even get him onto a vape because I said, well, at least that would be better. Or those snooze. Yeah, a lot of people have got those these days. Yes. So they're, they're, this is the thing I hate about uh, some of this kind of uh, American culture is this, it's, it's much easier to have halfway quit than to quit entirely. And snooze are these little puck, puck pouches of tobacco you put in your cheek and they're not great, you know, it's not, but it's so much better than cigarettes that if you had to kind of have these two bad choices, you much rather have this one and you'll be fine. And because it sounds like, oh, you're promoting the use of tobacco, like there's a, like people aren't happy with it. And it's just like, you know, I'd rather someone have a cold than have full blown AIDS, you know, yeah. but, but the way they look at it, it's like, oh, you're promoting people having colds. It's like, well, yeah, compared to the other thing. Yes. You, is that the thing you had the, the other yeah. day? Well, Eric Gakes brought one to England and we went to watch the football and I tried it and his, it was like rocket fuel. I nearly fell over. Yeah, yeah. People have caffeine ones as well, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. This called, oh, um, something with a Z. Oh, Zin. That's what his yeah. was. It was a Zin. Yeah, yeah. You, you felt like you got high off it, didn't you? Yes, so. you do all get high. <laughs> but no, that's something separate, the oh. Zins. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, I'll have another word with Dad when I get back. Anyway, back to what I was saying is that- Well, you know, okay, I'll just one more <laughs> thing because this is your dad. I, I mean, know, I but know. this is something very serious. Yeah. When's the last time you got his lungs x-rayed? Uh, he probably has never had them. Like, See, x-rayed. that's the thing. You're his dumb son. I don't care what you say, Peter, blah, blah. Yeah. You show someone their jet black lungs, that might be what it takes, especially someone in their 70s to be like, wait a minute, you know, I don't have that much time left anyway. And is this really worth it? You don't, you never know. I mean, I would love to get him stop to stop, but I would bet you a Bitcoin he doesn't. No, I believe you, but <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just hard. saying that like- I, No, it's hard. I mean, but I remember- It's gotta kid. be scary to watch. It's, it was worse as a kid. I'll okay. tell, tell, tell you why it's worse as a kid, because you smoked, people smoked everywhere. We'd get on the planes and you could smoke. Do you remember yeah, people smoking course, on the planes? Yes. In that horrible smoking department yes. that stunk and it was gross. And so like it, you were more exposed to it, but it is, you know, he's th- there's three kids. There's three of us who've tried. My mum tried. It's just like this, um, you're pushing against an immovable immo- force. I'll give another go though. Why not? Yeah, just, I mean, that's like saying, well, no one, no one's, you know, it's like saying, well, we've tried to have a currency that's not based on government and it hasn't worked. So what, you're going to give up? Touche. Right? All right. I'm going to be on that. Uh, as I was saying, <laughs> getting, getting back to the ideas of uh, yeah, whether it's libertarians, anarchists, this kind of like small or end state. My, the thing I've always struggled with, Michael, which is why, again, I want to talk to you. And I've asked you this before, but but what can we do? Who's, who's we? Someone like me, like you... Like Danny, who... Well, Danny's a lost cause. <laughs> That's hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Manchester. Not even from Manchester, yeah. near Manchester. <laughs> Good <laughs> luck. He's from fucking Macclesfield. What's it called? Mackles? What? Macclesfield. That sounds like an American city. Macclesfield. You just me. <laughs> Shouldn't it be called like, like Brockinghamshire or something? <laughs> That's Mac- Macclesfield in... Cheshire. Cheshire. Oh, Cheshire. Okay. Yeah. Cheshire. Macclesfield's a weird place. It is. They're all, all those little cities. That's the thing Americans don't appreciate. Americans think everyone in Britain's like a dance, like, oh, rather, you know, with the pinky up. You have all these weird little towns yeah. and it's really like effed up in these places. And it's, it's, I don't even can't wrap my head around them. Why didn't you like London, by the way? I got the first time I was on Rogan, there was something, I said two things that got me in a lot of shit. One was climate change. And the second was pointing out that um, how ugly 
the people are in Great Britain. And they came after me like, well, you're ugly yourself. Well, I'm like, well, then I would know, wouldn't I? And then I actually went online and there was an article that said like the most Google thing in, the, in either Europe or the UK is why are British people so ugly? Um, I was, I had interviewed Ari Up, who was the lead singer of the punk reggae band, The Slits. She was Johnny Rotten's uh, stepdaughter. Yeah. And I told her the same thing. I'm like, I, I'm such an Anglophile. My favorite author is E. Nesbitt. I have all the Roger Hargreaves, Mr. Ben books. And, but I, I hated it. And she goes, yeah, we all hated it. We all couldn't wait to get the fuck out of there. So of course, if you like what we like, you're gonna hate it too. Um, I thought the people were, as Americans, you are raised with this idea that British people are an order of magnitude smarter than we are. That's not true as a New Yorker. I don't think British people are particularly brilliant. And if you ask any British person, sure, they'll be defensive and say, hold on, Americans are pretty dumb. That's true, but they will admit that British people are also not particularly, there's plenty of dumb people. From yeah, yeah. Um, I thought the city itself didn't have that much to offer coming as a, as a New Yorker, because you guys didn't even have skyscrapers, right? So London isn't as compact as New York City. Um, the food wasn't, what I would expect from a city of that kind of caliber. Um, I, I just, we, we just didn't, it was, a, it was fine, but being an Anglophile, I had such high hopes that I'm like, this isn't some magical fairyland. I think maybe because you're a New Yorker. Yes. You know, you're used to a, a massive, interesting city with great food, cosmopolitan, interesting people. Right. You know, you can live within that small radius and get everything you need. I probably, I liked New York the first time I went because it was grander than London. But I wasn't like, I wasn't blown away. Yeah, of course, yeah. And I think maybe if you're coming from maybe Austin and going to London, yes. it's a bit more romantic. You go to Buckingham Palace and all yeah. that stuff. What did you do there? And of, course, and, and of course, New York, you shouldn't go there now. Just let's be clear. Like I, I, New York's dead uh, and they're raping the corpse. Um, we went to... I mean, the British Museum is absolutely amazing. Yeah. It's just, it might be the best museum on earth, maybe outside of the Hermitage in, in, in St. Petersburg, I, which I haven't been to, but uh, you know, in terms of reputation. Um, we, I think my friends saw some couple of shows. I wasn't interested in that. Uh, I don't, this was 2001, so I, I don't have a very right. good memory, but- You should it, come back. Uh, I, I probably will at some point. We'll host you. Take you to Bedford, where I'm from. Okay. <laughs> now that you'd be disappointed in. <laughs> hey, you I, said it was I, I want right. to go to Kent. That's where my sister lives. There's, Is it? there's nothing really going on in Kent. Oh, okay. Because my author, E. Nesbitt's from Kent. So I always wanted to kind of, yeah. make it it's nothing. Okay. If you're going to get outside of London, I would say go to Oxford. Yeah, the Cotswold. The Cotswold, Cambridge. Actually, Manchester, where he's from, is great. The, okay. Well, Manchester's a party town, isn't it? Yeah. 24 the, hour party people, right? Yeah. And the people are, are like the friendliest in the UK. Okay. Or, or go up to Edinburgh. Or even better, just fuck it off and go to Ireland. That's where my dad's from. My family's Irish. Half okay. of it. I, Ireland's. Ireland's hard to hate because there's not much there, but the people are brilliant. Okay. And so, and they love Americans. Do they? Yeah. Oh. They love Americans. Okay, that's rare. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of, they get a lot traveling over to play golf where my dad's a member. Okay. And they absolutely love Americans. Okay. Yeah. I've always been uh, more partial to Scotland than to um, Ireland, just based on what bands I like. Like who? Altered Images. She, they just dropped world. a new album for the first time since 84. Uh, it's, uh, it's The lead singer is Claire Grogan. She was also the lead in that movie Gregory's Girl from, I think, 80, 1980 or I 79. I don't even know what music this is. Well, it's just, it's like new wave. Okay. But the funny thing about the movie is their um, Scottish accents were th so thick, they had to dub it into British English for the British audiences. <laughs> well, didn't they have to do that in the subtitles for, was it Train Spotting? Yeah, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have to train. They have to have subtitles because it's Scottish. I don't know. They did that with the Geordies as well, didn't they? Was it Sunderland Till I Die? A Geordie Shore or something? No, I think it was Sunderland Till I Die. Um, oh so, yes, so, you're right. You're right. So the Newcastle accent. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So when when they no, and even no, no, that was it. You know, Ryan Reynolds has bought this football team, Wrexham. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So there's a series called This Is Wrexham. And even their accents, the Welsh accents, even when they speak in English, they've got subtitles, so the Americans can understand yeah. it. We have, we have the craziest accents. But I think if you come over, you, they're the places to go. But I always say to people, get out of London. Okay. There's so much more to see outside of London. And back on New York, we used to, you know, we travel around with this show because the first interview we did was in New York. We Here, Miami, New York, LA, Vegas, San Fran, Nashville. We kind of stopped going to New York. Yeah. 
It's horrible. Yeah. I, I was just there this past summer because Tim Pool put up a billboard of me in Times Square. <laughs> so I'm like, I got to see this with my own eyes, you know, bucket list. And I was, I was livid that I had been gone for a year and things hadn't improved. You as somebody who lived there from there, what, what did you hate about the change? What is it? Because we, we come in as tourists. For me as a tourist, well, firstly, as a podcast, it was hard because there's less and less people to interview because yes. they're all left. There's a lot of places closed down like kind of Irish bars we used to go to. The whole city smells of weed. I don't mind weed, but it just smells of weed. And then there were people openly trying to sell us cocaine in Times Square. Again, I've got no issue with people doing drugs, but it was a signal to me. Yes. And then everything, it almost felt like it was becoming... Why little, would you buy cocaine on the street? Like, of all the drugs, like, yeah. like, especially in this fentanyl <laughs> age, like, of all the... If all the things to do, if you're gonna get your, if you're gonna spend your money, buy your cocaine from a reputable source. Yeah. Like this is a talk about forget your dad and the cigarettes. Like yeah, this is the one where you don't want to get it from the guy in the street in Times Square. Yeah. Kids, if you're gonna use cocaine, <laughs> make sure it's from Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it's going a little bit Gotham City. It's, it's like, gone a lot Gotham City. Yeah. So. First of all, the thing, I, there was so many cool spots in what I, my little ha travel hack, which I'm comfortable sharing with everyone is, uh, and my, my friends who I travel with, it sometimes just annoys them, but who cares? I'm the blue check and they're not. Whenever I go to a different city, I always go to the weird ice cream place, yeah. right? But it, cause that's also in the cool neighborhood. Okay. And I've been to a lot of cities, been to a lot of weird ice cream places. The best one happened to be the new one, New York ice and vice. It didn't survive COVID. All the little establishments that were only in New York that you couldn't find in other places anywhere on earth that were really kind of special and magical, none of them, or virtually none of them, managed to survive the COVID regime. So what do you got left? Do we need another? If I need to go to Target, I need to get on a plane to go to Target. That's number one. The fact that it is getting more and more unsafe and people are like, oh, that's New York. It's always been like this bullshit. There's, there's, a, there's a big difference between I kind of feel unsafe and I'm witnessing violence breaking out on a regular basis. Oh, murders. Yes, it's, it's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, that subway station that got shot up was my subway station for, from 2005 to 2016. I was half a block from that train station. You could see the police tape outside my old apartment building in the photos. And it's just like, this isn't the sort of thing like, oh, that's just New York where you know, you have wanton like mass shootings and terror, and also the knowledge that there's absolute certainty that it's not going to improve. Uh, you know, the, the very first day on his new job, Mayor Adams, the new mayor, witnessed like a mugging and called it in. And it's just like, this is, this is crazy. Um, and, you know, when I came back in August, I've told the story, people gave me crap about it. Within an hour, I was at a restaurant with my friend and we were having a nice wrap, uh, like the, the, the meat, the food, not the song. And there was a guy peeing on a train, a truck in the street, not on the sidewalk. He was in the street where the cars go. And I'm like, yeah, New York was dirty in the past, but not this level of you're peeing in the street. It, you know, you'd always be up against the building or in the subway station or something like that. And even that's obviously not ideal. So there was this kind of, there was no, maybe I'm spoiled because I'm here in Austin now. There was no sense of hope. There was no sense of like, you know what? We're struggling, but we're going to make things better and like punch above our weight. Like you might find in maybe a city like Akron or something, one of these like little second or third tier cities. It just felt like, why am I here? And, and if you sat someone down and said, why would you go to New York now? All the answers would have been historic because of New York's reputation. Yeah. There's, I can't think of a single thing that positive that has happened in New York other than me leaving in the last three years. And I don't think anyone else can either. Did we even leave Brooklyn last time? No, we stayed in Brooklyn. Yeah, we didn't oh, leave. Oh, sorry, it. I see what you mean. Yeah, no, I don't we, think we so were. we booked Brooklyn and yeah. leave, we didn't leave Brooklyn. Yeah. We didn't even bother going into the city because the time previous was so shit. And by the way, it's somehow still got more expensive. Yes, that's the other thing. The cost of living is going through the roof. So like, that's just horrifying. Huh. So do you think it's done or do you think it's just a cycle? I mean, I think and a long enough timeline, everything's a cycle, unless you buy into the argument, which I am amenable to, that cities are an outdated mechanism of social organization. Um, I don't see any possibility of New York turning around in the next decade. I don't see how. And do you have any reason to go now? Or are you just so settled here? I, I, 
I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure I don't step foot there. The fact that I, as a lifelong New Yorker, can sit here and honestly say that I had a better time in Los Angeles <laughs> than in New York is something that I have to admit, <laughs> honestly, but it cuts to the core of my being. Because yeah. it's always been this rivalry and I would be able to easily tell you why New York's better than LA and I can no longer make that argument. And let me assure you, LA is no paradise. Mm. It's it's still in its own way, very much a shithole. But I was just in both and it's night and day that LA is running the table now in New York. Well, I've always done this show in person and uh, as much as I can. And uh, from, from when I launched it five years ago and my places I went to most was either New York or LA. That's where I could get the highest density yes. of interviews. It's now Austin and Nashville. Yeah. We, I mean, we started in Nashville on this trip and came here. Nashville, have you spent time there? I have never been. I'm going to be there in a couple of weeks for Michael Knowles. So it's kind of, it's, it's like Austin, just smaller. Uh, okay. It's got its own quirks, but it has a very similar kind of feel. Um, we like both of those. And, you know, as we as we become more concentrated in locations, it's, it's going to be here or Austin that yeah. we spend most of our time. Occasionally we'll go to LA. Miami a lot as well. Miami sometimes, yeah. Miami's okay. Um, but... There's, it's, there's becoming no reason to go to New York and limited for LA. And even if there is a reason to go to New York, I'm sure you're having a much better time here in Nashville than you are in New York. Well, like I say, that time last time in Brooklyn, we, we booked the place in Brooklyn. We didn't leave Brooklyn. I think we went out for one meal around the corner. Uh, when we're, I mean, we're out to dinner tonight. We're off to Three Forks. You know, we, we'll all, um, we went to um, our friend's place the other night. We, you know, we, in uh, uh, Nashville, we're out two nights. There's a reason to go out. If, uh, you know, it's more homely. It yeah. feels more homely. Oh, for sure. Whereas like sometimes these big cities, are, ugh, it feels like a fucking hassle. Yeah. And, and the thing is, it used to be, okay, the New Yorker will tell you the cool spots to go. There are none. Or maybe I don't, I, at least I don't know where they are anymore. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure some have come back. Sure. But I mean, I w when I was there in August, I would say a good 25% of storefronts were unoccupied. Mm. I mean, for, for New York, that's just an obscenity. I mean, we went into a restaurant one time when we were there, and it was five, six o'clock. The steak restaurant, yeah, around Times Square. Got like five people in there. Yeah, and their rent must be crazy. There's no chance of surviving that. Yes, London hasn't suffered that problem okay. like New York had. Um, it seems to have rode it out okay. I think you know my my experience of going back there is still kind of vibrant and bub bubbly, but we don't have optionality. Optionality. London is our major city. You're not yeah. going to go to Manchester instead. Whereas you had that option to yes, come yes. here, or you could have gone to LA if you wanted. Yeah. You know, we don't have that, so maybe that's why we yeah, survived. Yeah, that makes it. sense. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Forget that other bit. Let's talk about your book. Okay. Because uh, the white pill. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to read read this because I think uh, this will be a good setup for everyone. Uh, the Russian Revolution was as red as blood. The Bolsheviks promised that they were building a new society, a workers' paradise that would change the nature of mankind itself. What they end up constructing was the largest prison the world had ever seen, a union of Soviet socialist republics that spanned half the globe. It was a country where people's lives meant nothing, less than nothing, and they knew it. But no matter what atrocity that the Soviets committed, the secret police, the torture chambers, the show trials, the labor camps, and the mass starvation, there was always someone in the West rushing to justify their bloodshed. For decades, it seemed perfectly obvious that the USSR wasn't going anywhere until it vanished from the face of the earth, gradually and then suddenly. This is a story of the rise and fall of the evil empire and why it is so important that the good never give us give up hope. This is the white pill. So, you know, I, I'm going to interrupt you because it's the first time I've heard someone read it out loud. That's the blurb on the back cover of the yeah. book. And I wrote it in one sitting. And, and wow. you, when you write it out, you kind of don't ever think about it again. And that's the first time hearing it from somebody else's uh, um, mouth. And uh, let me actually do a little digression because this is really, really funny. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who had a, I wrote an article about this years ago. I had a friend who had a girlfriend and she was terrible for him, and that's fine. But at a certain point, you know, they were talking getting married, having kids, and she just declared that the kids are going to be raised vegan because that was a big part of her identity. And now I had a big problem because it's not just the veganism per se, but it's also like your if you your planned wife is going to unilaterally make decisions for you like this, that is a, an issue because you have to have the ability to both have your input and so on and so forth. So what I did is he had sent me some. A, um, DMs that they're going back and forth. And there was a website at the time called extranormal.com or .org, whatever. And when you put text in there, it would animate it. And you would have these kind of two characters read the text. So I had these two bears 
read, you know, he, the boy bear and the girl bear, they're having the argument. And when he heard the words being said by these characters as opposed to him and her in writing, and you could hear, oh, this is someone talking to a crazy person. They broke up and, you know, he's now happily married to uh, this woman, Jane, who's just absolutely terrific. So it's very kind of um, moving to me to hear it said by somebody else because I, I think I stuck that landing. Yeah, well, so I tell you what's interesting about this is it isn't possible for me to read every book of everyone I interview because there's too of many course. people and there's too many books. But when we started the planning, Danny Danny read it out to me. I was like, well, I need that. Fucking... That's why I bought it straight away. I was like, okay, I actually need to read this. I don't have a strong enough uh, understanding of the history of Russia. Um, so I, I almost want you to talk me through this, explain me to the, the, the main parts um, about the history of Russia and also give me a lens into because my assumption is with this and there's kind of a hint in there I think there's a hint in where you say there was always someone in the West Russia to justify the bloodshed there is a lens into what's happening in the world currently uh, yeah I, I I will leave that to the reader to do their extrapolations yeah uh, I, I really hate this kind of idea that um, everything in the past is necessarily replicated you know like like I, I'll give you like an example when um governor uh, excuse me mayor Bloomberg, uh, who was mayor of New York after Giuliani, he was having a ban on uh, like large sodas at 7-Eleven, like you couldn't buy a supersized soda. And Mike Huckabee, who was governor at the time, I believe of Arkansas, was like, this is just like North Korea. And I'm like, shut the fuck up. You know what I mean? Like you don't have soda in North Korea. It's, if, if they could have their small sodas <laughs> with some calories, they would, you know, so calm down. So I'm very wary of when people are like, oh, you know, part of the reason I wrote this is I was on a conservative podcast and they were going on about how Biden's a communist. And I'm like, do you even know what communism is? Like, like you're using this word. Like, do you know what life is like under these regimes? It's not some senile old coot, you know, on TV wagging his finger at you or, or you know, having CRT in the classrooms. It's, and the thing I realized is I don't even know what it's like. I mean, I was born there. We came here when I was two, but like, I didn't have any sort of understanding of just how horrific it was. But to your point, there is the one takeaway that is spot on is many of these organizations that were carrying the water for this nightmare regime are still in place today. So it's a valid comparison to say the New York Times which did everything in its power to obscure Stalin's starvation of millions of Ukrainians is still the paper of record. You know, it's the Atlantic, it's the New Republic. This isn't metaphors or analogies. It's literally the same organizations. So insofar as there, I don't even know if you call it a parallel, if it's literally the same place or the same outlet that's, you know, was in place then and is in place now. Because it was that like, because we, when we read it through, I was like, okay, this sounds like something I need to understand more about. I want to understand this history and I'll read the book for the history. But that line stood out. There was always someone in the West rushing to justify their bloodshed. And we were questioning ourselves, well, what does, what does that mean? Because I, I didn't know you meant the Atlantic. I didn't know you meant the New York Times. Yeah. I have read the book yet. We were trying to like say, well, I mean, is that the same as us? Is that us buying an iPhone from China when the Uyghurs are being enslaved? Like, what, like, what is it? You know, are we ourselves, are we, you know, complicit? No, no, no. That's not, that's not what I meant at all about, about the average person being complicit. What I meant is, is that, uh, there was a letter that was signed by 500, 500 leading Americans, influencers, right? And there is someone from every university, Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, so on and so forth. You had a bunch of people who worked for the New Yorker. You had a bunch of prominent writers and they were just making these claims about, so this is before the internet, this is before television, right? This is the 30s. So you are looking to these people to be the intellectual class. They're the ones who understand things. They're the ones who kind of spell out, well, what does this mean, right? It's, it's the Chris Cuomo of their time, so to speak, in some ways, or the, more accurately, the Samantha B, because the many of them were humorous. And they were saying explicitly in writing that what you're hearing about the Soviet Union is wrong. They do have freedom of speech. They can read any of the great books you want, from Aristotle to Lenin. And you know, you see this in writing and you're like, this is insane. And this is at a time when in these countries, if you had a book that was banned, you're going to a labor camp and possibly your whole family. So to have, it wasn't some kind of like opinion thing where it's just like, 
they have freedom of speech in their own way, but sure, they ban hate speech. They were lying to people in the West about everything that was being done. And the things that were being done were not ambiguous. The New York Times headline front and center said, there is no starvation in the Soviet Union. The Russians are merely tightening their belts. So it's not some sort of left versus right, Republican, Democrat, you know, is Boris Johnson a loud mouth, is Trump an asshole. They were lying about what was being done to millions of people over decades. And it's many of the same organizations that are still in place today, and they have never been held accountable. And the fact that even I, as a, someone who was born in the Soviet Union, had very little idea of just what was going on there over the decades, also speaks to the lack of interest in many Western media circles about basic human rights violations if the narrative doesn't suit their purposes. What was their incentives to lie about it? So Eugene Lyons was a communist and a reporter, and he got sent to the Soviet Union to be their man in Moscow because they knew he'd, be, he'd have an in there, and he did. And when he saw what was going on there, he completely turned, and he's just like, this is horrific. And I quote him in the book, he described it as the guinea pig model because they had this, uh, I don't want to say, I don't know if fantasy is the word, but this vision of what a, a society could look like. And the, the Soviet Union was promised to be a scientific society. It was scientific socialism. In the West, you have these plutocrats, these capitalists, these monopolists, these, like, why, did, why is it right that Elon Musk gets to own Twitter? Like, who's this asshole, Right. Their version is, all right, if you have the government managing everything for everyone, it's going to work out and you're not going to have this one random rich person having all these power over people's lives. And there's something to that. That makes, there's a logic, internal logic to it. And his point was, they didn't care what was done to the people in Russia because you have to experiment on someone, right? So let's see if this new society, and it was a new society, there hadn't been a nation like it anywhere previously. So you can make the argument with a straight face, this is the society of the future because it is unprecedented in many ways. Let's try it. Like we were, we're socialists and there's different kinds of socialism, democratic socialism, communism, so on and so forth. Let's, and this is the variant of socialism that won. This is the first country where it identifies as socialism and tries to implement it. Let's give them every chance we have in our power to see if this system works out. It costs us nothing. And sure, the Russian people squeal and, you know, just like the guinea pig squeals when you experiment on it. But that was their kind of model. They're the elites and this was their opportunity to put their ideas in practice without having to bear uh, any of the costs and basically having all the benefits because then they could say, look, we told you so. We're the smart ones. Was any part of that um, politically influenced because it was seen that this socialist project would weaken the Russians? So the argument was socialism is going to be wealthier for everyone. The argument would be, yeah. Yes, because if you don't have that surplus value being taken by Rockefeller and Carnegie and you know Bill Gates, right? If he's not taking all the profits for himself and everyone's working for the sake of society, you're going to produce more. Every individual is going to keep more of their own money, so they're going to be wealthier. You're going to have advanced technology, so you're going to have to work less. It's going to be you know, less labor intensive. Uh, and once we industrialize, because Marxism is very much an industrial revolution ideology, and we have factories everywhere, everyone's going to be wealthier and happier and better off. And that prophecy had a lot of uh, um, support for itself when the Great Depression hit, because this was the long, look, we told you for decades, capitalism is going to implode under the weight of its own contradictions. The stock market collapses. You have unemployment you know, some like, it was like 23% or something crazy here. It's, it's systemic. It's not changing for a decade. And they could say, look, we told you so. So since we predicted that capitalism is unsustainable, it's going to collapse of its own weight. Therefore, what we're telling you as the alternative is going to work. We just have to give it a chance and industrialize Russia and, and look how much progress we're making. Five more years, you know, they had the five-year plans, another five-year plan, another five-year plan. And what's, what's, what's fascinating to me writing the course of this book is how many, at different, you know how you play poker 
at a different stage, like I'm out, you know, you have a bunch of people on the table, I'm out, I'm out. There were different steps when people who were, you know, committed communists or committed leftists were like, all right, uh, this is okay. Cause the thing is they also didn't want to say I'm out and, and turn because then they're siding with the right and the conservatives who they knew are bad people who they, from their perspective, who they knew are like, okay, I'm not for this. And these people are, are, you know, for the worst element of society. So I have to be opposite to them in some capacity. But then, you know, a big one was when Stalin makes a pact with Hitler. And for a lot of, that was a big like wake up call for people on the left when they had the Molotov Ribbentrop pact, when they were like, whoa, whoa okay, okay. We, we can carry a lot of your water, but if you're shaking hands, well, not literally shaking hands with Hitler, this is exactly what we're against. And, and you know, that was a, the big turning point for many, many people. Of course, a few years later, FDR shaking hands with, 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 uh, with Stalin and it's, it's kind of fine again, but there were, and I talk about in the book, different points where people were like, oh, okay. So even though the critics are despicable and I hate them, they were right. We have the benefit of hindsight that we know this model completely doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. It's been shown time and time again. But was it created in good faith that actually this this can work? Or was this uh, a, a model that was created purely out of you know, uh, an ideology of a small group of people who knew they would maintain themselves as the elite? And But again, so Lenin was obviously the big figure here. Mm. And one of the people I discuss, uh, two people I discuss heavily early in the book were Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, who were hardcore communist anarchists. Uh, they were deported from the United States. Berkman uh, tried to assassinate Frick, who was Carnegie's right-hand man. Uh, they were, you know, one of someone who was a fan of Goldman uh, killed President McKinley here. So they were no strangers to political violence and advocating for political violence. When they get set to Russia, uh, early on, Lenin had to consolidate power, right? So it wasn't just the Bolsheviks. So he had to work with the Mensheviks. He had to work with the left SRs. He had to work with the anarchists and basically form this coalition. So then they were all like, all right, the Bolsheviks basically have the megaphone. Let's all work together and make this work. But once that Russian civil war was won and the forces of the czar, the whites were defeated, overnight, Lenin is like, all right, you got, and he started rounding up all these other uh, organ, or, or these other ideologies. So simply being formerly a Menshevik or an anarchist, you're going to jail. And Goldman and Berkman saw this and they were like, Berkman was in prison when the, the Russian revolution happened. And he had said, this was the happiest day of my life. This was something I've been working for, for years to see socialism seize power. Like he couldn't believe it. And he says, when he got deported there and landed in the Soviet Union, he wanted to kiss the ground. And he's like, this must have been what my ancestors have felt like when they countered the Holy of Holies in the temple. And then he's, then he gave him every opportunity. And then when he, you know, he fled, he's just like, this is a bigger nightmare than the worst kind of capitalist system. They are targeting, he's like, Goldman says this herself. She goes, I, I'm no opponent of violence. But in a revolution, in terms of creating a society for the workers, you're using the violence against the workers. These are the people we're supposed to be for. Like you, you guys are monsters and everything that Hitler and Mussolini did, you guys set the stage for them. So they were very, very, uh, um, dis her memoir of these years was called My Disillusionment in Russia. So they were the ones who very much had their eyes open. But the fascinating thing is when they left, Emma Goldman spoke in London, uh, you know, in, I believe it was in the late twenties. And when she read Emma, you know, she had as much left-wing clout as anybody, you know, she was she kind of always put her ass on the line and she gives a talk and she, it opens with a standing ovation. And when she was done, you could hear a pin drop because as she's denouncing the Soviet Union to these uh, lefty Brits, they didn't want to hear it. And they're, they just felt very betrayed by her. And like, how can you be saying these things? And this is, I've been to the future and it works and, and this sort of situation. And it was almost as if, it was almost literally, you don't know what you're talking about, even though she had been there and they'd never left the confines of their posh homes. And that is a theme, I think, with many intellectuals where they feel comfortable opining about places they've never been in without having done their homework. Now, obviously I haven't been in the Soviet Union, but you do a lot of work, you see both sides. They were only interested in hearing their perspective, which is this is gonna work and it has to work. Did any part of it work 
when they first started? Was there any successes or was it just a complete abject failure? From well, the I don't know. I mean, it, it worked in the sense that it became more industrialized. Yeah. It worked in the sense that you had increased literacy. But and for example, Sputnik happened, you know, yep. they were the first satellite. But the question always is at what cost? So you could say that you solve the problem of famine by starving everyone. And if you starve everyone, no one's hungry, right? So it works. So I don't know what works means in this context, but it, 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 the costs of what it was, was done to these people, including many children, is something I had not been aware of at all. And while learning about these atrocities was extraordinarily uh, uh, disturbed by. How, how horrific are we talking? I mean, I, I think it's much more horrific than anything I know. I'll give you just one example. Yeah. And this is under Lenin. So they, a lot of these kids became homeless. You know, the, the parents died or were arrested. They were abandoned. And there are some bunch of street kids in, in Moscow and they were pickpockets, little thieves, whatever, teenagers. So the secret police rounded them up, took them to the cellar of the prison and would beat the crap out of them, asking them who your like, uh, um, partners in crime are, literal partners in crime. Then they take the kids in the car, drive around Moscow and make the kids point people out. The kids didn't they weren't members of some kind of Yakuza. They were poor street children stealing to get food. And if they didn't point people out, they were going to get the shit kicked out of them. So they would just start pointing at people at random. But the, the line that really disturbed me was hearing that it was the hardened prisoners, the adults, who couldn't bear hearing the sounds of the kids screaming as the kids were realized they were being returned to the jail. So when you hear things like this, it's the sort of thing that I think is something almost unimaginable. And I'll, I'll give you another example where it's just like these things make logical sense, but once they're applied with their kind of scientific logic, it becomes something so inhuman, it's almost impossible to appreciate. So how, they would have collective punishments. So becoming being married to an enemy of the people was in itself a felony, right? So. If you're arrested, your wife's going to get arrested, right? And what's she going to plead not guilty? She was married to you. So overnight, your kids become orphans, okay? At the same time, any family that was friends with your kids now have to shun them because why are you friends? Why are you talking to Peter's kids? Oh, are you, were you in cahoots with, with Peter? Is your dad an enemy of the people? So there was, there was one story where this girl overnight becomes an orphan. Her family friend, you know, she, was, she had a someone her own age, they, they try to take her in. They go to talk to some big shot in the government. They're like, what do we do? And they're like, you should put her on the street. Like you're putting your life. And that's, and these kids go out in the street. You can imagine what happens to them. And there's hand wringing in the Kremlin about what are we going to do about all these kids who are killing themselves now? But they're killing themselves with good reason. You know, if overnight my parents are gone and no one will look at me even in school or talk to me, what am I supposed to? And it's on my record that I'm a child of the enemy of the people. What am I, what, what am I supposed to do? So when you hear things like this, you know, which make perfect sense, given the premises of the system, it, it, it does a number on you. And I think for most people. And that I, the thing is that happened to Gorbachev. When he was a kid, his grandfather got arrested for supposedly being a Trotskyite or something. And he talks about how my house became a plague house. He, that was his words, meaning like everyone in the village just avoided it like it was radioactive. And he, he's a kid, was he five, six, seven, eight? Now no one wants to talk to you? For what? And we don't even have that here. Imagine like if you were a murderer, you know, and you deservedly go to jail. Maybe your kids wouldn't be, it wouldn't be like, wouldn't reflect on your children. They would know, their friends in school would maybe be weird, like, oh, your dad's a murderer, but it's not like I can't talk to Peter's kids anymore because maybe I'm putting my life in danger. That wouldn't be the, the concern. So was it just all about maintaining control then? I, 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 it's hard to get inside the heads of the people at the top. But at the same time, you know, they themselves were often prisoners because if I'm an interrogator and I'm interrogating Peter and I need to break him to get a confession, if I am in any way showing mercy to you, then my boss will be like, oh, you're colluding with him? Maybe we should check you out. 
So now the incentives are, even though I know you're innocent or I know you didn't do anything, I have to break you because it's my skin and my family. And if it's a choice between you, Peter, and my family, it's not going to be a hard choice. Were there any attempts to overthrow it? Um, what Stalin did especially was he wanted to atomize society as much as possible. So he wanted right away, if something happens to you, your spouse is in danger, right? And your kids are in danger. So any kind of private relationship was a threat to the public sphere. So he did everything in his power to make sure that there were none of these private links, what we call civil society, which make up the basis of a thriving country where you know, if there's a crime, instead of necessarily worrying about the cops getting there in time, you have the neighborhood watch, you have neighbors like look after you. Oh, you know, have you seen my daughter? Have you seen, oh, this is where I saw him, you know, that, that kind of thing. Now, any kind of link is dangerous. It's inverted because now if I'm arrested and I'm told, okay, we have the risk, we, we know for a fact you're a traitor, you're an enemy of the people, you're a Trotskyite. Who were the 10 people you were colluding with? Well, I talked to you today for an hour and a half. So your name's going to be first on that list because I need to give them 10 names. And I, the better names I give them are people I had long conversations with. So the incentives became completely perverted um, uh, you know, in, in, under the Soviet Union and the allied countries. A, a bit, so I uh, watched a film, The Lives of Others. Oh, yes. So like that. Yes. Yeah. The Stasi were in many ways very different and in some ways more pernicious than the Soviet Union. So... What drove Stalin? Was it pure ideologies? Yeah. I don't think he was a particular ideologue. Uh, there's no question that Lenin and especially Trotsky were these kind of cerebral philosophical types. He was a bank robber. He was like a thug yeah. you know, in his youth. He was never this kind of great ideological intellect. Um, it's very hard for us to, I mean, and he had members of his own family arrested. So this wasn't, you know, some kind of complete hypocrisy. Um, I don't, it's, it, he is not as a um, fully fleshed out character in this book as some of the other people, because it's almost impossible, I think, to get inside his head. Because uh, even with Hitler, it's like, okay, you're driven by hatred of the Jews. You, you have this vision of Germany conquering the world that's not a very complicated mindset to get into him. It, it, it's it, 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 a lot of it makes a lot less sense. And, and it, it just in terms of internal logic, how are Lenin and Stalin both considered in modern Russia? I think my understanding is that Stalin is having a bit of a Renaissance because he is kind of this vision of when Russia was this, I mean, Russia, Russians complain, and I think fairly that they don't get enough credit for being Hitler. Because if you look at the cost of lives that the Russians gave versus Americans, I think it's like 100 to one, it's some crazy, you know, different metric. They got to the bunker first, they were raising the hammer and sickle over the bunker. Uh, you know, it wasn't the stars and stripes. Uh, now, a lot of these lives were lost because Stalin fucked it up really badly. And he was called to task for this after he died. And they were sending soldiers into a battle without even bullets. So like they were just getting mowed down, just, you know, your life was just worth even a bullet from the Germans. So there was some really crazy things going on. And when, when um, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa and invaded Russia, Stalin couldn't believe he was betrayed and they lost days just doing nothing because he was just shocked and, and just sat on his hands. So that is a big, I think, historical, uh, um, something that they view as an injustice that, you know, we're not getting the credit for this. We're the ones who won World War II against the Nazis. Um, Lenin, I think is, you know, he's still, there's still controversy. Should he finally, he's mummified in Red Square and he's in his tomb there. Should we finally bury the guy after a hundred years? Uh, it's actually over a hundred years. Oh no, 1924, he died, I believe. So, but you'd have to ask them. I, I think there's much more of a fondness, not necessarily for them as individuals, but for, when the USSR was a rival superpower to the US and the entire world was, you know, we're, we were one of the two big guys. And part of the reason I wrote the book, and I don't really have a good, I, I have a hypothesis, I don't have a great one is, this for the West was the unquestioned number one foreign policy concern for 50 years, right? Everything that was done in foreign policy in Western circles and Western politics was, all right, what does this mean in terms of our rivalry or animosity with the Soviet Union? 
military buildup? Are we going to this country? What are their interests? What are ours? How are we going to fight them? And now it's just kind of like this never, ever happened. And it's it's very bizarre because we'll talk more about the Civil War, World War II, than about this Cold War because because the narrative isn't isn't easy. Uh, it's not really because in many ways the bad guys are the like I said earlier the organizations that are still in place today, and that's part of the reason why I wrote this book so people can understand this was the entire world for decades, and it's just completely being forgotten, which is something you know out of 1984 like they could just just vanish, you know, decades of history. Well, you can't help but like everybody knows the horrors of World War II under right. Nazi Germany. Countless films have been made. Uh, you learn it at school. Um, it's still talked about today, even to the point where I know I, I know German people are still embarrassed about it sure. today. It, to people who weren't even alive during World War Two, the first I, I mean I have an understanding of life under the uh, USSR was tough, but the first I heard about this was you telling me you're writing the book. Yeah, and, and when I and again as someone who's from there, the fact that I didn't know any of this is something that's like, how is that the case? Like when I started writing this book, the Berl I didn't know why it was such a big deal that the Berlin Wall fell. Like we knew, okay, there was this wall and you know, divide yeah. East and West Berlin and okay, it was cool, it fell. But like what that meant and why this was like one of the biggest deals and why like when I was writing that chapter, I was crying. It's, it's like, until I was writing, I'm like, this is just this amazingly miraculous, beautiful story of the victory of peace over oppression. And it's just like, oh yeah, it was, there was this wall and then it fell. It, it's, it's almost like just some kind of construction site and you had this, oh, there was a wall and they knocked it down. You could watch a GIF of it. it it's, it's, uh, it, it's very bizarre. I mean, that might be an age thing as well because I remember when the wall came down. I mean, I probably was, I don't know, 12 or something, 30. I wasn't particularly old. I didn't understand why this wall was there. Yeah, it but you weren't in Auschwitz. Auschwitz. No, no, but what I mean is like I, I wasn't educated as to why there was an East and West Berlin. I didn't understand why you know, Berlin had been split after World War II and who controlled I just didn't know any of it. But that's the, but that's the whole point. This but, was in our lifetime. Yeah. I didn't know that either really to the extent, but we know why we fought Hitler, right? Yes. We knew why we teamed up with Stalin to fight Hitler. Why the Berlin Wall was built is not something that's common knowledge, which is crazy to me. Do you believe it's to do therefore as Stalin supported the West, it was kind of ignored? Or, and do you believe that there was as much reason to perhaps send troops into Russia as there was to send them into Nazi Germany? Uh, World War II is obviously an extremely complicated, yeah. tricky situation. Uh, uh, my buddy, Curtis Yarvin, has this quip about um, which genocidal ideology should I be more concerned <laughs> about, the one that won or the one that lost? Jesus, yeah. um, and there's Pat Buchanan, I think, uh, wrote a book arguing that if we stayed out of World War II, we, just, we should just let them kill each other off and then just pick off the one who was left. I'm not a strategist. And part of the reason I wrote this is the atrocities of the Nazis are taken for granted. It, it, you know, it's just a given that this is just an abomination. What this kind of complements is this guy that we were teaming up with you know, during World War II He's no angel. And I think there's an understanding he's like a brutal dictator, but we kind of think of brutal dictators like, you know, like, you know, you have to have long hours at the factory and you're kind of hungry and then you can't really criticize him in the media. It's so much more uh, pervasive and insidious than that. And, you know, the tagline for the book is, you know, it's almost impossible to explain to free people what it's like to live in a totalitarian dictatorship. And it really is. Uh, and I tried my best to replicate what that feeling is like, where literally every aspect of everything you do has to be viewed through the lens of politics. Who am I talking to? How much can I trust them? What am I saying? You know how like sometimes you leave a job interview or like I've done, I, this happens to everyone I know who's done Rogan. They leave Rogan and they think, fuck what I say. Cause it's three hours and you're like, you know, something's gonna be pulled. Like, did I just fuck up my career? <laughs> but imagine if that's your case with literally everyone you talk to. Yeah. Every person you meet has the power to call in the secret police and you have to worry that night, are they going to come and take me away and I'm going to have no re uh, resources to fight this situation and what that does to you. It, it, it's something I, I don't think any of us in the West are able to emotionally uh, um, wrap our heads around. Well, you have no ability to have your own identity. Right, because the whole point of collectivism 
is to minimize the power of the individual. Yeah. And you might say that's a good thing. You don't want Elon Musk or Bill Gates or George Soros or Donald Trump, you know, being able to, you know, snap his fingers and people live or die. And you could understand that. But then it's like, wait, wait, if you're saying the powerlessness of the individual, think about everyone listening to this, what that would mean is if you were powerless. If you don't have choice over where you work, what you read, what music you listen to, who you talk to, where you live, and how what that would mean to you and how that would affect your day-to-day existence. And constant fear that you might end up being arrested, tortured, sent to prison for something. Or even just give it- For it an does, opinion. But it doesn't even have to be that bad. It could be that if I'm at work and my boss is a dick and I just raise my voice to him, tomorrow I'm working in a mine. And it doesn't have to be a prison. It could be like, I have a nice job and so, today you're a podcaster and tomorrow you have to be working in a fast food restaurant. Now it's not the end of the world. Oh, they didn't have fast food restaurants, but you know what I mean? Like you're, so, you know, some kind of, you're washing dishes. But to have that sense of like everything I have, the very little I have can be taken away at any time for any reason. And I will have nothing I could do about it. And did you speak to many people in research in the book who actually lived through this? No, no, no. This, this was, I mean, I also, I had plenty of background from my work with North Korea right. and having visited North Korea, which is the closest um, analog you're going to have on the earth today to kind of living there in these times. When did you go to North Korea? Uh, 2012. You've never been? It's the no. new Milan. Yeah. <laughs> no, I fancy that, you know, there was a time I used to run a lot. Oh, the marathon, ago. the Pyongyang yeah. marathon. I used to run a lot and uh, I just, um, I got inspired by this podcast called Rich Roll, who's like an ultra athlete. And uh, I was like, right, I'm going to run the 10 most dangerous marathons in the world. Like in my head, that was, I was going to do Afghanistan. I was going to do North Korea. Why is North Korea dangerous? Well, just, you know, in the thing in people's minds, are like oh, these okay. dangerous yeah, yeah. countries, yeah, no. you know. I, this is what I was, I was going to do, Sudan. And then uh, then I put my back out and I had to stop running. That was years ago. Um, but no, I, I did fancy going. There's actually a guy, a crypto guy, who got arrested over there for going to teach how to yeah. use cryptocurrency. So did you enjoy it? Oh, Yeah. Because it was so weird and different? Well, it was the closest I could have of an experience of seeing my family went through back in the day. Right. And also the, the, the thing that um, does a number on you is the, how normal the people are. So you, when you see that these are just regular human beings, and just how that's the scary part. And they're in this gigantic prison. It, it, it's, it, would, be, it would be better you know, because there's this kind of low-key racism in the West. Asians are weird, like Japan, you know, like I want to go to Japan, but I know the culture is going to be like going to another planet. So you're kind of like, okay, they're different from us. And then when you go there and they're cracking jokes, your guys are cracking jokes and you're like, holy shit, this, this is, there's so much more just even banal than, than you expect. And, and that just makes the nightmare that much worse. Yeah, I guess the closest I would ever have been, I went to Venezuela a few years ago. And okay. At least they have the freedom to leave. Um, across the border, a lot of the, a lot of people. Were, you know, I went to Cucuta at the border in Colombia, where people were coming in and out to try and get certain goods. Uh, but I also got to go in and experience and just little things. Um, when you get out of uh, East Caracas, which is kind of the cosmopolitan part of the city, we stumbled across a huge government march. There was, you know, Chavez murals and Maduro murals everywhere. You know, everybody is uh, supported by uh, like a food basket from the state. That's the closest I got to it. But I don't, I don't. I think the horrors there are more the difficulty people have in earning wages, but they become resourceful. I don't think it's anywhere near as you know, horrific as uh, of what you wrote about. It's also that I'm sure they have internet there, right? They do. Yeah, so they don't have internet. They don't have access to the outside world. So that kind of complete control of information is something that is really very much surreal. And the, when the, prob, the newspaper, which is called Truth in, in English, is telling you one thing, and then as soon as you have information about the rest of the world, it's like, wait a minute, something's not adding up here. And that was very key to bringing down these regimes. Yeah, my friend Alex Glastein works at the Human Rights Foundation. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you know yeah. Alex? No. You, I think you'd really enjoy interviewing him. He's, he's amazing. They, um, they did a project called Flashcards for Freedom, and what they would do is get memory sticks with Western films, Western culture, yes. and they would have these um, distributed in North Korea. And this was a way to get people so they could actually see what life is like outside yes, of North yes, Korea. Because yes. a lot of people have no idea, yes. I guess. And and you know that's what would drive people to at least try and escape. Yes. There's horrific stories of people trying to escape. And there is this, um, there is this uh, supermarket in um, Houston, which is still there. It's uh, I think it was a key food, now it's a Marshalls or something like that. And um, a Randall's, excuse me, it was a Randall's and that's whatever. Boris Yeltsin, who was kind of Gorbachev's rival towards the end, he went to NASA. And while he was there, he's like, let me go to the supermarket. And there's 
you know, photos of him there and he's looking around and he's seeing the amount of items on the shelves is something he'd never seen in his life. And he's seeing that the people there are just like school teachers, tr cab drivers, you know, truckers. These aren't some kind of dignitaries. And he's, I, I think one of the um, uh, people describing it said, oh, they seem to be particularly shocked at the size of the radishes or something like that. And you see these pictures and he's just walking around. And the thing that was really kind of jarring is he went from there to Miami, I guess, back to uh, the USSR. And on the plane, he's holding his head in his hands. And he's like, they had to lie to us because they knew if we saw what was going on here, that it would all go to shit. Oh yeah, that's the photo. I'm going to go to that supermarket. I'm just going to start bawling because he's there. But the thing is, imagine what that's like, Peter. You're a major, I think he was like the equivalent of mayor at Moscow at the time. Yeah. You're on that flight. And you realize everything I've been told is a lie. And you know it's a lie. It's not like bare shells versus this. You can, there's kind of a gray area. It's, they were told that they have more food than us. And then you go look at this and you're like, I've never seen this much food in my life. And this is one rando supermarket in the middle of buttfuck nowhere, right? Bumblefuck nowhere, mm. excuse me, pardon my French. And so he's just sitting there and he's like, holy shit. Like it just, it completely scrambled his brain. How did that impact Yeltsin? Did that make him want to have closer ties to the West? Or? Well, it made him much more hostile. Uh, and Yeltsin was a bit of a, was a big mess. Like, let's be clear. Like, yeah. there's a question there. But it made him realize, hold on. Like, this isn't like some kind of, you know, difference of opinion. Like with the NHS, oh, should we have more spending? Should yeah. we should have, you know, deregulation or something like that? This is like, okay, I am part of a system that is built on brazen lies that is also keeping all the people in my country hungry for no fucking reason. And I think other than, the, cause this is towards the end, right? Mm. It's very hard uh, to have people at the top who are comfortable with like, you know what? So the kids, when you see kids are hungry, you want to feed them. It doesn't matter where on earth they are. This is why, you know, a lot of these charities like have photos of these hungry kids. It's like, it, it warms your heart. You're like, let me help. What can I do? So when you see this, it's like, okay, this isn't about tweaking. Like something is systemically and it, it, wrong just at a base level. Are there in modern Russia, and you might, you might not know this, but uh, are there any kind of remnants of this in modern Russia? In what sense? I'm thinking specifically with, say, let's talk about the Ukraine-Russia um, war. And I don't want to get into too much detail on that, but my friend's married to a Russian. And when she gets phone calls from her mother to talk about it, he said it's crazy the shit she tells him, her explanation of why they're at war. Like he said, it's unbelievable. Like his wife now knows that she was being lied to in modern Russia. She knew if she was there, the reasons she would be given for the war and how successful it would be would be complete lies. And she was trying to explain to her mom, I, although say that, I also believe we're being lied to. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the idea that a population is going to be lied to about war is nothing yeah. exclusive to Russia, as any American can tell you. Yeah, um, I, I'm thinking about when we were told that if we don't bomb Syria, the Kurds were going to be all exterminated, remember? And everyone was on TV saying this, like we have to go into Syria, they're gonna kill all the Kurds. We didn't go into Syria, we didn't bomb Kur Syria, and they just stopped, about, stopped talking about the Kurds. Mm. It's just like, it just stopped being a topic of conversation. So it, it, it's- the, And we were lied to about Iraq. Uh, uh, well, that's an obvious one. And even inclu including the first Iraq war, mm. when they were told that the Iraqi soldiers are going to hospitals, pulling babies out of incubators and all, all this other stuff, this kind of World War I German atrocities that they supposedly did. So yeah, it, it's I am delighted to what extent people are savvy to the amount of war propaganda that exists in the West. And I know very many people, quite understandably, are supportive of Ukraine and you know in that conflict and view them as the victims of a foreign aggressor. But I think there's also a lot of people asking very fairly, hold on a minute, where's all this money going? Like I want peace. I don't want any civilians, including Russian civilians, to be killed or drafted or put into harm's way. But I, we're just sending money. Like I, I, you can't. Like if I, if me and you are at war, I can't just throw a briefcase of money at you, Peter. And then it's like, all right, we're at peace now. So. I think it's a very uh, um, uh, uh, um, a situation. I think we're in a much better place than we were in the 90s. You are empathetic, though, to the Russian, the, sorry, the Ukrainian cause? 
Well, I'm empathetic to the Ukrainian citizenry. Yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, I did a little live stream. I raised money because my dad was just there on business and he was next to, you know, a kid on a train and the kid was crying that, uh, that, that you know, they're going to get his dad and so on and so forth. Then he got out, you know, uh, of Ukraine and there were all these refugees who were being, getting food. And that to me is the main priority, making sure everyone who's a civilian is, is taken care of and is uh, healthy and happy. But I, I don't know where this conflict is going and I'm not at all informed on the subject yeah. with, despite my biography. Do you think there's ever a chance that Russia would have like free and fair elections? I don't know what that word means. I don't think free and fair elections exist. I think freer and fairer than what they have. I, I would say the elections we have in the UK are freer and fairer than Russian elections. I, I think Americans underestimate and it's necessary for the narrative, how genuinely popular Putin, maybe until recently, is with the Russian people. Okay. Uh, there's this idea that if someone's like a thug and a crook, that he's basically cheating at the ballot box and he can't, you know, the real people are freedom lovers and blah, blah. I don't think that's the case at all in many of these countries. And I would hazard a bet that at least as of, let's say 2021, that he his approval rating was sincerely very high with the Russian people. Why is that? Is it because he kind of holds these strong Russian values, this kind of independent, fuck the West, we can do our own thing? Yeah, and if you're a Russian and you went from the Soviet Union, who's like one of the two rival superpowers, and now you're like kind of poor and like no one's talking about you, they're talking to Germany or they're talking to China, the guy who's like, I'm gonna make you, I'm gonna make, I'm, go I'm, I'm only saying this half joking, the guy who's like, I'm gonna make Russia great again, you can see how as a Russian, especially someone who's older, you would respond to that, to those glory days of, of having you know, world-class power. Do you think though now that the kind of reputation of Russia has been damaged with this war within Russia? I don't know how aware of that they are. Right. And I, I, I think here's the thing, like with North Korea, I can speak on that with some expertise. They revel in, the, they call themselves a shrimp among whales. Hmm. So they revel in the fact that China or Russia or the US or Japan will yell at them. And they're like, no, what are you gonna do about it? So there is this sense of punching above your weight and defiance that countries like this do enjoy. When you say they though, is that the elite political class? It's not just the elite, it's no? the North Koreans as well. And you can't blame them. They're like the size of Pennsylvania. And the listen, you know how in Hollywood, it, you know, if you and I at a restaurant, who's going to whose table, right? Who's the big, who's, who's the big shot and who's gonna kiss the ring? The president got his ass you know, to go over there. Bill Clinton got his ass to North Korea after he was president to get two people that had hostages out. They're going to his house. He's not going to their house. So that he can say with a straight face, look, I am the guy who can make American presidents come here and kiss my ass. And, and there's something to that. Yeah, I mean, I struggle to understand uh, North Korean pride within the citizen, citizenry because they appear to have zero freedom. So I would struggle to... When's the last time you talked about Laos? When I went to, uh, last time when I went to Chiang Mai, probably. Okay, but yeah. see, everyone in America has an opinion on North Korea. I don't think any American, maybe they can't find North Korea on the map either, but they don't know what <laughs> Laos is, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that is fair, but I also think at what cost, you know. Oh, well, sure. But I mean, for them, it's like, Right, the costs are enormous. I'm not advocating yeah. for the North Korean system, let me be clear. But what I'm saying is I think the pride that they feel in being a player on the world stage, despite their extremely limited resources and their extremely small size, that is has an element of truth to it. Yeah. All right, so if people want to read this book, it's out, tell them. Whitepillbook.com. And do you, want to, do you want to show your other books for you? The Anarchist Handbook is did gangbusters. It's a collection of historical essays advocating for anarchism from different perspectives. And Dear Reader is my North Korean book. Right. And then you write as well. Before we close out, there's one other thing I just wanted to get your opinion on. Uh, yes. Twitter, how are things going? Oh, I, I, I love it. Because it's more, an, it's more towards anarchism. No, I, well, Twitter's a private company, so. It, I know, but it's kind of like opened up to kind of. I, what I like about, it's, I'm not looking at it from anarchist perspective. Okay. What I like about Twitter uh, the, the one thing I could point out, which I think everyone listening to this, or for the most part, will agree with, increasingly people who are spewing their propaganda from whatever p political persuasion there are, now they have this thing where people provide context. So yes. you'll have some apparatchik from the Republicans or Democrats just making some ridiculous claim. 
and then readers will be like, in reality, this photo, they had, I think there was some photo of a kid who was like a victim of the Ukrainian war. And the context was this photo is from 2003. <laughs> so things like this, where you have these photos that are used to play in people's heart springs that are used in very cynical ways. Um, that in and of itself is a wonderful thing. The fact that corporate journalists who are the enemy of the people, who are some of the worst human beings on earth then and now, are not being a protected class on Twitter is an extremely healthy phenomenon that they are ratioed constantly, that they are not given reverence, but are given a small fraction of the overwhelming contempt they deserve. That's something I admire a lot on Twitter. And I also think it's wonderful, and this is something that is being politicized and shouldn't be. You could think Elon Musk is the devil, and that's fine. Um, there's a lot of things he does that are wrong, whatever. The fact that child abuse is being talked about and discussed, and there's articles about how he's not doing it successfully. The fact that he is making a priority to remove this kind of imagery from Twitter is something that I don't think should be a political football. It's something that I think everyone should be more aware of and more supportive of. Yeah, me and Danny were talking about this yesterday, that there's this weird kind of like underground part of Twitter, but that is right there for anyone to find if they want it. There, right. There's this whole section of porn on Twitter that I didn't even know existed. Yeah. It like, but it's just there. Yeah. The one click away, like anyone can find it. Was, it was a... It was a bit mind blowing. Uh, just on that point on the mainstream journalists, do you think we've seen? Uh, I don't use the term mainstream because okay. they're they're so radical and so. Which we use cunty journalists. I say corporate journalists because to call them uh, mainstream excuses their malfeasance and depravity. Do you know what? I'm going to change my language? There's uh, corporate journalists. Do you think? We do you think the New York? Let, let me, I'm not being sarcastic. Yeah. Do you think that someone who works at the New York Times has a mainstream ideology? Uh, no. No, they don't. Actually, no, they don't. Um, I think it's just uh, historical context. I right. just use that term. But do you think we're seeing uh, like a fracturing and breaking down of corporate journalism? Yes, I, I think unquestionably. Um, I think trust is asymmetrical. Yeah. So if I am your friend and I tell you 100 truths and one lie, you don't regard me as truthful. That lie you know, carries much more weight than those 100 truthful statements. So when you see these outlets are engaged in brazen uh, you know, I always say the corporate truth is factual, but not truthful. They'll say, take things out of context just to try to skew things in one way or another. Once you spot their tactics, you realize, you know, they're corporations, they have an agenda, which is fine. You know, everyone has some agenda. Uh, once you realize what they are and what they're up to, they lose a lot of their gravitas. Uh, and I think that it's by all accounts, they're losing their clout. Uh, and they're losing their ability to define the issues of the day and what one, one's perspective should be on those issues of the day. Well, look, you know our industry is the Bitcoin industry, and we have to routinely bat against the, the lies about uh, what Bitcoin's Bitcoin is. over. Didn't you hear the article? Bitcoin's done, right? Every time Bitcoin crashes, Bitcoin's... And I, I saw some, twi uh, some tweet, and I'm sure you've seen literally probably 100 of them, people putting together all the articles at different yeah. times when Bitcoin goes down. Like, Bitcoin's over. It's a Ponzi scheme, right? Yeah. Well, we even had or it's, white, white, or it's racist. Yeah, yeah, it's um, ones and zeros are racist. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, an all right uh, currency, or yes. it's you know, it's uh, boiling polar bears, or you know, we. I love the idea that someone in the KKK doesn't use like American currency. Yeah, <laughs> like what are they using? Like clan money? But 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 you laugh. But this is what I speak about them being factual but not truthful. They can say it's true. It is true that Nazis and white supremacists use Bitcoin. They also use. Every other currency, money is used by everyone. So to say it's largely or exclusively the domain of Klansmen is so disingenuous. And that's why so many people increasingly uh, condemn and despise them, them being corporate journalists. You know, someone's going to set up Clan coin now on Ethereum, aren't they? It probably already exists. It probably already exists. I bet it fucking does already exist. Um, final question on that. You just said if someone told uh, 100 truths and one lie, uh, I am not part of the corporate media. I am just an independent person making content. I I make mistakes. Sure. How do you deal? With, like, what would you say as some, someone like I should deal with that? When I I made some fucking catastrophic uh, points during COVID. I got things I read wrong, got totally wrong. My complete interpretation. I what would I've you say? I've things that? wrong a lot. So what do you deal with that? Because is I it always, a lie or is it a mistake? Well, this is what I do. I, I try to be as transparent as possible. So I'll come back to it and I'll say. This is why I came to that conclusion. 
These, this is the information I was based on. This is why I was wrong. So they might still think you're a lie. So you know how it works. When you get successful enough, you become a grifter. Yeah. And then when you get even more successful, you become controlled opposition. And then after that, I think you become a sellout. So that's kind of the gradation of success in terms of being influential or Where a podcaster. Are you, are you a sellout? Then? I'm controlled opposition now. Okay. So I just made it. So I'm really excited. Where am I? I'm, like, I'm grifter still. You're still grifter. <laughs> yeah, I'm still yeah, a grifter. You're still grifter. Yeah. I think everyone in Bitcoin is a grifter. Yeah. I, I think Bitcoin hasn't become normalized enough for anyone to be controlled opposition. Once you have Bitcoin being used by like Whole Foods or, or places like that, then you become controlled opposition and Bitcoin itself is going to be the controlled opposition currency, right? <laughs> That's, you, you know this is coming. Yeah, I do, I do. Um, so I, I think in those cases, transparency and also acknowledging it's, I understand why someone would think looking at this, why I'm full of shit. Because you can understand their perspective. And, and I always tell people, you shouldn't trust me. Whatever I say in this book, this I think 600 footnotes, Double check it for yourself. You know, don't take something at face value just because I or anyone else is saying it. Well, listen, Michael Manis, I am. Um, this is a this is a Bitcoin show. We haven't talked about Bitcoin. Uh, I'm trying to do more stuff that isn't Bitcoin. Uh, push myself out of my comfort zone. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I'm a bit out of my depth, and I will go and read the book. But I appreciate you coming on again and giving me the time. Um, I've, I've enjoyed every interview we've done. And I'll see you in six months, where hopefully you haven't had another six drink. months. Boy, we're gonna have a, we're gonna do a six month test. We'll yes. do a check in. We're gonna do a six month check in. Yeah, we'll see how we do about that. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yeah, go and check out the white pill. Um, I'm gonna be reading it this week. Awesome, great pleasure. Thank you. 